The Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Dr. Naledi Pando, is now briefing the media on the developments regarding the ongoing Ukraine-Russia conflict. Let's now take you live to that briefing. Well, um, uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, Kailisa, I think I did say that uh, one of the things we would like to see is consistency in the approach of the international community to all countries when they violate uh, international law. Um, you would recall, for example, the killing of uh, young boys in the Palestinian territories there was hardly a resolution, hardly a peep in the United Nations. You'll recall the events of April 2020 in the occupied territories. There was no call for sanctions. You would recall that land has been raised, taken over, with illegal settlements built. You have a new election of a prime minister we indicates that he will continue to proceed with the building of settlements. There is no concern of a breach of sovereignty or territorial integrity. So we are saying you cannot have the United Nations utilized in a partisan manner. It must be a body that equally stands for human rights for all for its status to be respected. This has to be a basic condition. And this is something uh, uh, we, we have reiterated more than once. On the phone call, uh, we, we await uh, a response. This is still on our timetable and agenda. Um, I don't know why uh, there isn't a cessation uh, of, of hostilities. But I think there's a very serious breach of trust in the whole context. And to some degree, Ukraine and the civilian people of Ukraine are the victims of a huge breach of trust and a concern about security on the part of Russia, as well as a concern about its own freedom and integrity on the part of Ukraine. We need negotiations that help to resolve that level of insecurity among the parties. It has to be addressed. It cannot be neglected. It's a long-standing historical problem that must be confronted uh, in real terms. So um, we very, I must say, are uh, encouraged by the work that President Erdogan uh, is leading uh, but you'd need to really have many more interlocutors around the table before there would be a settlement that is reasonable and that results uh, in the cessation we're looking for. But we do believe that we should all urgently advocate for a cessation of hostilities because the human toll is just terrible. Um, so while uh, we're not saying negotiations for cessation next, but we're saying that uh, genuine negotiations with uh, a respected interlocutor, we, we cannot understand, for example, why the Secretary General of the United Nations is invisible in this huge international crisis. As to the... Uh, origins of the resolution. We've heard all sorts of stories that uh, an organization, an NGO, uh, drafted the original resolution uh, and then it was appropriated by a member state and presented to the uh, body of the General Assembly as the resolution, I believe, of Ukraine. Uh, but its origins uh, are somewhat suspect from what we're hearing, but this is for me it's speculation and rumor. I don't have any facts uh, as to its origin. I wouldn't be, you know, clued into uh, uh, those, those deliberations. I'm also concerned about um, the call to withdraw Russia from the Human Rights Council. 
Because I think when a country that is party to such conflict and hostility is placed at the margins of international bodies, the level and opportunity for increased lack of accountability is just too open for us. So we are very concerned that the more marginal you become, the worse the offenses might be. On uh, Crimea, uh, I think a, a Russian uh, um, writer has just written a really fascinating article that goes back thousands of years on the history that is linked uh, to this crisis. And certainly, uh, Crimea appears to be at the heart, but there are other uh, regions, smaller regions as well. Um, and so all of that would need to be uh, open on the table and be resolved. Uh, I, I think uh, that leaders uh, of the world can certainly come together, either on a unified platform or with a respected neutral arbiter to assist to have genuine deliberations on what could be a settlement that all parties would be satisfied with. I don't know if my uh, uh, colleagues, the DGs, DDGs, ambassadors, wish to, to add. I, I draw on them. They brief me, so. Um, uh, yeah? Yeah, all right. OK. I think we're good. Um, it was her and then the rest. Hello. Good morning. Uh, Slinda Lomasigane from ENCA. Um, I just wanted to ask exactly where is South Africa when it comes to uh, mediating? Um, are there talks with our Russian counterparts? Have there been any conversations with um, the president of Russia at all? And I would just like to hear from the ambassadors that were on the ground um, exactly how is the situation now? Do we still have any South Africans left? Uh, people who chose to stay? Um, as well as the situation with the students who were brought back what's happening with those with the with those guys because we know of course they want to continue studying but it seems rather difficult for them to do it here um, is it possible to get them back into the um, EU thank you Uh, good morning, uh, Minister and uh, Ambassador Sitsundayezo from Power FM. Uh, Minister, just two quick questions. What would be your response to the criticism, uh, especially from uh, political commentators, that uh, the Minister and the President are not speaking with one voice on this matter? You, uh, there's been suggestions that you seem to be more uh, upfront on South Africa's stance while it appears the president is taking a more of a diplomatic stance. That's the first question. The second question is, if South Africa is in agreement that um, what Russia is doing in Ukraine is a violation of international law, it would then suffice that um, it's a violation of human rights. Would it then not make sense to express that view by voting um, uh, with the resolution? Thank you very much. So, Karen, you'll be the last. Um, thank you so much, Clayson. Uh, I have a question. It's, it's about another war. I hope I can slip it in here. It's a little bit closer to South Africa. Um, Ethiopia, the Amnesty International report that came out, I think, was last week, Detail, or was it earlier this week, detailed gross human rights violations in Ethiopia. And I know the President mentioned it yesterday, which is why I'm asking about the, about the Ethiopia. Um, I just want to know how, uh, how are engagements going there in terms of trying to get dialogue going in Ethiopia? Thank you. And I'm sorry for hijacking your briefing, Clayson. Thank you so much. Nokanyam Tambo from Jacaranda FM. 
Uh, Minister, just to jump on to Ndayeto's question, what, can we just get a sense of what consultations take place um, when the decisions of abstinence, for example, are arrived at? Who do you consult with? Um, yeah, and just how do you arrive at those? And how does DOCO deal with voices um, that disagree with the, the, the current approach that uh, South Africa has taken? Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to ask the ambassadors to just come in on the ENCA uh, uh, question. Um, in terms of uh, any mediation, uh, South Africa has indicated its readiness to be of assistance. Um, should we be invited, of course it would be by invitation either by the Secretary General, which would be our preference that the UN uh, leads on this, uh, but we've indicated that we are ready and we do have the experience, the uh, institutions, and we believe the individuals who could play a very important role. Um, on uh, the matter of uh, students, um, perhaps Ambassador Madrid Tuka could speak to, to that. Ambassador? Oh, okay. All right. They're going to come around. All right. Then I'll continue with the others and then they'll come back. Uh, well, you know, I've been amused about this one that the president and I are not at one. Uh, unfortunately, the foreign minister and the president work closest together in any country. Uh, and if they don't, then you have real problems. And we work very closely together. And I do seek the President's advice on all uh, matters uh, where necessary. There are areas in which I have to make decisions, uh, but I would always speak to him. Uh, and on the key issues, such as abstaining uh, from the vote, we did speak and agree on the position that we would take. So there's no difference of opinion, and I really don't know where that comes from. I saw it, I was overseas, and I saw some weird article that the president, I had said something and he didn't agree with it. And, and it was, you know, anonymous source or whatever, I, uh, you know. So I don't know about anonymous sources, but I, I put it out there. But we speak. I, I do uh, uh, talk to the president uh, uh, on, on these matters and uh, would be guided by him because sometimes uh, I may be a bit more... <laughs> you know, uh, tough or whatever. Uh, and so uh, uh, he, he does serve to, to, to guide all of us. Um, well, I had to ask ourselves, we had to ask ourselves, the resolution. Does it advance the objective we'd like to achieve, which is peace? And as I said at the end of my uh, reply to the last question, I'm worried, and I indicated this to the various foreign ministers who've called me to ask us to vote in support. I'm worried that if we place Russia outside of institutions of global governance, we're almost giving a license to say, do what you will. We've now given up. There's nothing more. So our reflection on what is proposed is to what degree is it positive in advancing the cause for peace. So it may look very good to vote yes, but does it advance? Does it help? And this is the challenge. Uh, it, we can be very popular and vote yes all the time. Vote the way everybody thinks we should vote yes at this point, no at that point, and so on. But all the time, the driver for us is we have to have peace, and part of that settlement will include Russia. You're not going to be able to exclude them from settling this matter. And we don't think that what is being done is helping to draw them in toward a settlement for peace. You can't use a the United Nations instruments as tools of war. They are there to achieve peace and security for the world. So that would be why we would abstain. 
On Ethiopia, um, we've had discussions uh, with the AU facilitator because we can't displace the AU. And again, uh, we've indicated both to Ethiopia through our president in discussion with his peers that uh, South Africa stands ready to be of assistance. We've offered assistance of either accord or any other uh, negotiating and peace resolution uh, non-government actor in South Africa to be of assistance. We've said we'll make funding available should that be necessary. So again, we're ready to, to, to assist. We are glad that the humanitarian corridor has now been established. We understand from President Obasanjo that there are regions that are not getting the aid and we need to look at that, so we'll pursue that discussion uh, uh, with them. Um, on uh, Jacaranda, that's a really interesting question, actually. A lot of consultations take place. Um, I, we would not decide without talking, for example, to our permanent representative uh, in New York. And of course, we must talk to the president, who's our lead, on, on foreign policy. Uh, but in the end, it's me, because <laughs> I will communicate the decision. And if there are, there's a need to respond on it, I would be the one uh, who would respond. If the matter affects colleagues such as our ambassador in Ukraine, will also say, listen, we're thinking this. What do you think? Or this is coming up. Do you have a view? We also speak to our colleague, Ambassador Nkosi, who's in Geneva, where we also UN institutions like the Human Rights Council are, are located. We just lost the audio there of uh, that media briefing. We've just seen the uh, Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Dr. Nale Dipando, reacting to the suspension of uh, Russia from the United Nations General Assembly, uh, even though she wasn't very clear on South Africa's position on Russia. Safe to say that the South African government expresses concern that uh, the more marginal the country is, the more offences committed. Well, she's still briefing the media on the developments regarding the ongoing Ukraine-Russia conflict. And uh, I do understand that uh, audio has been restored and uh, we'll go back there right now. Uh, our friends also in the north call us from Europe, United States. Actually, I've never had so many calls from foreign ministers since February uh, than I've had since February. Uh, almost every day. Um, it's a wide set, but you don't do it alone. You can't because uh, it's too complex. Foreign policy is so difficult that you must have as many, I think, uh, uh, you know, advisory notes to help to arrive at a determination. Sometimes Ambassador Nkosi will say something. I say, no, I don't agree. You know, then I go to somebody else and say, what do you think? And that ambassador, you know? So it's a whole process of consultation, but in the end, the president also has to be party to it. We'll take over uh, that you will enjoy doing it. Yes. I don't know what's wrong with the microphones. Why don't you keep it clearer? Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, Minister. Oh, let's uh, use. It. Thank you, Minister. Um, thank you, Excellency Scott. Life. Um, we've spoken on the phone to over the law and, and so on. To, to the security issue. With the security issue in um, in Ukraine, of course, 
in, in, in the reports that um, it is still a very, very um, dangerous situation in specific areas of, of Ukraine, the southern areas, um, and of course some of the, um, the intensification of, of conflict in the eastern parts of, of, of Ukraine. Um, so it's very dangerous. Um, the reports I'm getting from other ambassadors in Kiev itself um, seems to be that it's a little bit calmer. But it's not just about the, um, the war uh, situation in Kiev. Um, there are other factors as well. Um, you know, the release, I said yesterday, of, of, of prisoners, um, people in the streets. Um, we're a little bit worried uh, about looting and so on. So it's not as if um, the security situation are just changing overnight because people are moving to, a, or the military is moving to a different area of the country. Um, and, and, and so it's still very dangerous. With regards to the, um, the South Africans that are still there, we are aware and in contact with about five families. Um, it's not just individuals, it's in one case a family of about 10 people. Um, and all of them are, are, are safe. They are in contact with us and tell us that they, at this stage, don't want to go out. What we have um, shared with them is to, in, 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 in cases, is to be sure to have a plan. Because what we have learned um, with, with any war, and, and we've had it as an as a embassy, luckily, um, is the fact that you need to have your evacuation plan. You have to have plan 1, B, 3, a number of plans because things change all the time. And I think it's been very helpful for the families. Um, there's one family that is in Kherson, which is an occupied area at this stage. Um, and so they, they, they are not on the Ukrainian side anymore. They are on the Russian side of things. But they tell me that they are safe at this stage. Um, and so we are monitoring it. So it's absolutely by choice that they are still there. But they know that they can count on us for, for assistance. Minister, that uh, from the Russian side, we have got no issues of security. There is no humanitarian issue with the South African community, i.e. the students, those South Africans who are working in Russia. Like in the there are no issues. We got a database of those Africans who have had presence with the embassy. Our website is open for those who are not registered to register their presence in the Russian Federation for in case there are issues. Otherwise, presently, life goes on. All our students. We've got about uh, 895 ministers, if my figures are correct, South African students all over the Russian Federation. They are in touch with the embassy. They know what should they should do for in case. So that would be my relation to students at the Russian Federation. Thank you. The matter of what happens to students who've come back home is more complex, I think, because they were uh, undertaking a range of different studies, and many of the students were in private institutions, not even public, nor uh, had many of them been sent by government. Uh, it tends to be private. Families are funding them, or they have scholarships from uh, uh, donors. Um, we have uh, directed the students to the higher education and uh, science and innovation department for advice and assistance. But it is very difficult, especially for those students that are very close to graduation. If you don't have equivalents in the programs, um, it's, it's very difficult to, to assist and we don't know when. Uh, Ukraine would, would reopen uh, and, and institutions be ready uh, to receive students. So it is a very difficult uh, situation, but we've asked our colleagues 
in higher education to, to advise, because it's really not our domain. We don't have the full information on that. Yeah. Colleagues, just to, to add to that, um, it's indeed correct that the, the students have um, indicated that they, especially the ones that wanted to, to, to complete their studies, um, we have evacuated 52 students from, from Ukraine, of which 51 are in studying uh, medical sciences, so doctors and nurses and, and, and all of that. Um, we have had a meeting about a week ago between the Department of Higher Education and the deans of the medical schools in, in, in South Africa. And they have agreed after a consultation with the students where most of them have indicated that they would like to continue their studies in South Africa. Um, but our ambassador in Budapest in Hungary has also negotiated um, a program with the government of Hungary to take some of the students that want to go back there um, to complete their, studi their studies there and that would form part of a bursary scheme as well. So we are looking at, at quite a number of, of ways to, to, to address this issue and, 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 and it's an ongoing process. Thank you. Uh, I now respectfully close this briefing. I have colleagues who are addressing ambassadors and I'm sure they were very astounded when I walked out of the room. Uh, just as they were beginning to speak, it looked quite embarrassing. So uh, I have to go back and I thank you very much for having come this morning. Thank you.